How about you stop slapping me in my damn face? Mm -hmm. And then I won't have to turn my cheek. Why do I got to keep turning while you keep punching? The long-awaited race disparity report. Dorian Lawrence has said the latest government commission report into racial disparity pushes the racism fight back 20 years. Was finally released last week. And just as Judas offered up Jesus for sacrifice, so has Tony Saul here. No one in the report is saying racism doesn't exist. You know, we, we, we found anecdotal evidence of this, however... With black and brown British people being sacrificed this Easter. Let's take a look. Break it down! This highly anticipated race disparity report that was commissioned by Boris Johnson. Last year in the heat and anger of the killing of George Floyd in America. So Boris Johnson commissioned a team to find out how we can level up inequalities. And the subsequent BLM protest in the US here and in other parts of Europe. After all the calls for black lives to matter, the answer came today that in Britain they already do. Where millions of young people, young, old, black and white, came together. The Black Lives Matter movement last summer was the call to action. In a show of solidarity for the real lived experiences of black people across the world. Black lives matter. Hundreds of thousands of people line the streets. Now generally, these protests in the UK went off peacefully, with a few minor exceptions. And even with lockdown and the pandemic's limitations, most people backed the solidarity and the call for change. British people, white and black, are dying to turn the page on racism. Our government and prime minister's reaction to this outpouring of goodwill. The race commission was set up in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. Was to commission a report outline, or, or outlining the overarching disparities and the causation that many minorities still feel in this country today. Um, over, over the past few decades, it actually brushes away all of the recommendations from reports gone past. Though there has been no recent demands for a review into these disparities, as over the years since the McPherson report in 99, the inquiry into the death of Stephen Lawrence, under the Labour administration under Tony Blair, there is no doubt that there were fundamental errors. There has been several reports into racial disparity in the, in the UK. No less than three were done only four years ago. It's disgraceful. I mean, everything else leading up to this point has said completely different things, even government commission reports. The race disparity audit. I think the data that fills a glaring gap by analysing how persons' ethnicity affects their experience of public services and how that affects their lives. Under Theresa May, the Lamy review the implementation in full of my recommendations for a fairer criminal justice system. And the McGregor Smith review. The report could have called and implemented Baroness Ruby McGregor Smith's recommendation for a mandatory ethnicity pay gap. All these reviews back in 2017 outline many overarching systematic disparities. Institutional racism exists in every facet of our society. I think that I have all, always felt everywhere I go that I am different and I know that that is purely because of the colour of my skin. That black and brown people suffer in the workplace, in education and in the judicial system. Overarching consensus minority communities whose parents and grandparents crossed oceans to make their home here do face discrimination on the grounds of race. So many civil rights activists and community groups were somewhat bemused or surprised. The report is in a parallel universe, that's how I see it. It's in, in a stratosphere on another time continuum. That our prime ministers or the Prime Minister wanted to commission another report. Look, this is a, uh, a, a very interesting uh, piece of work. Uh, you know, I don't going to say the government's going to agree with absolutely everything in it. I don't going to say the government's going to agree with absolutely everything in it. Before implementing any of the other recommendations so far put forward 
It does not go to the heart of the problem and it, it does not seek to in, engage with injustice. Through any of the numerous other um, disparity reports over the years. But it became pretty clear what the government's intention was. It only had two objectives. The first objective was virtue signalling after, um, after the Black Lives Matter movement. Second objective was to set a different narrative that suits the government. They're saying institutional racism doesn't exist. If institutional racism doesn't exist, the state doesn't have to do anything to amend the behaviour of institutions. With Equalities Minister Kimi Badenoch. But actually quite a lot of the disparities they did find were not to do with racism and to do with things like class, geography, um, wealth and so on. Charging the government's policy advisor. With similar views having been expressed previously by policy chief Manira Mirza. We've overseen a 10 person commission, supposedly. Hi, sir. Now, our Prime Minister also appointed another member to this commission. This happens to be the Chair, Dr Tony Saul. We've examined the data and the evidence in a calm and collected manner, and we've really decided to try and take the heat and, and, and some of the sort of vitriol out of the whole area, because you know it's contentious. He made some pretty homophobic uh, comments in a column just over 10 years ago. But he is also on the record stating that he doesn't think institutional racism is a thing. They don't believe in structural racism. So obviously when you have someone like Tony who is chairing this report, we knew that was going to happen anyway. We're on record denying structural racism and institutional racism 15 years ago. Can you imagine a Holocaust denier being asked to develop a strategy on anti-Semitism? Half those people on there have don't understand the history of Britain. Somewhat of a strange appointment to a commission that is trying to ascertain the reasons and solutions to disparities amongst ethnic minorities. I am not black, nor do I consider myself to be black. Many people mistake me for being Negro because they don't know that I am currently living with the heartbreak of revitaligo. Now this report has been under fire ever since uh, its release from many quarters. A lot of people have been very critical of this report. The Sky, BBC, the newspapers, full of people saying that this is, for all intents and purposes, a whitewash and it's ignore, ignoring what a lot of people are saying is the lived experience of uh, black and other ethnic minority people in this country. Lady Doreen Lawrence. I think people are trying to hide behind and say, oh, you know, we don't have any problems, so there's nothing to report. Mother of Stephen Lawrence said and has warned that it risks pushing back the fight against racism 20 odd years. Also, Windrush campaigners have condemned the report for paying so little attention to the scandal that was exposed just three years ago. And just about every leading writer, commentator on race and on racism in the UK has criticised the findings of the report. I think this report actually takes us backwards in the debate. Our experiences aren't real, that we're essentially making things up. It was kind of like a middle finger up to, towards any ethnic minority. And challenged its methodology. It's very difficult to see how they could come to the conclusion that they arrived, especially given the huge amount of research there is over the years. It came as no surprise that the author, Dr. Sewell, after, after he gave a few brief interviews after the release of the forward of the report. What we did find was the evidence of actual institutional racism. No, that wasn't there. We didn't find that in our report. Before its entirety was released at half 11 the same day, Wednesday last week, basically did a dash and drop. And again, not surprisingly, many of its contributors have been unavailable for comment. The government didn't want to be interviewed tonight and the report's lead author wasn't available to us after the publishing of the report's recommendations. Some academics even claim they weren't properly consultated. Even some contributors named in the report itself were distancing themselves from it. One asked for his name to be removed. Another, Stephen Bourne, said he had no knowledge of the report. With one author asking for his name to be removed. People are just going to see your name there and associate you with a damaging report. And I had nothing to do with it. Also, 
The government's equalities, uh, equalities advisor, Samuel Kasumu. Now, Downing Street has insisted that the departure of its most senior black advisor, Samuel Kasumu, has nothing to do with the hostile reception to yesterday's government-backed report on race. Finally handed in his resignation after months of speculation of him leaving. Kasumu, number 10 special advisor for civil society, resigned on the day that the report came out. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't even know who he is. No, I don't even know who he is. Kasumo, number 10, special advisor. For I don't even know who he is. After he wrote in a previous regulation, reg resignation letter that the government has embarked on a politics steeped in division. Number 10 said he'd been planning to leave for months. Others close to him said his resignation was related to the report. What were in the findings of the report? Britain is a model to the world on diversity. <laughs> And what were their methodologies? If we work hard enough, get good grades, we'll be all right. It's a, it's a broken record. Let's start with health. Because the lives of ethnic minorities are far more important these than, than party political issues. Now, maybe you remember there was somewhat of a prelude to this report back in the summer. But now a government commission report cites racism specifically as a factor. By Professor Kent. P Professor Fenton. Recommendations were made by Professor Kevin Fenton, who engaged with thousands of people from BAME communities across the country. And what they consistently told him was that the issue of structural racism had a huge part to play. Put racism at the heart of why there was dis uh, disproportionate outcomes in COVID deaths amongst the non-white community. You know, the report looks at deaths in childbirth and you acknowledge that there's a disparity. You know, those figures, 2016 to 2018, 34 black women died per 100,000, 15 Asian women, eight white women, eight white women. You dismiss it. But in this case, the race disparity report has used none of the evidence or the data from Professor Fenton's review or has chose to ignore it. It makes me feel like I don't have a voice. I feel like I've been silenced because I'm trying to care for and make services equitable for the people I care for. Basically telling black and brown people uh, it's their fault for being overrepresented in frontline and low paid work. If you've got mental health problems, it's your fault. If it's a maternal death, it's your fault. Actually, it's all our fault. That wouldn't have anything to do with racism. Would it? You will never be English. You are African Caribbean. But why, so why, why will I never be English? Because you're African Caribbean. This brings me on to education and training. But even today, there were protests. Students at an academy just a mile from Westminster staged a walkout claiming new rules discriminate against Muslim and black pupils. Where the educational attainment level of white working class folk is our ceiling of expectation. And at the same time, black Caribbean kids are at the bottom of the league of the table with white British kids. As this report finds in many cases that Asians, Indians and many African students are doing much better than their white counterparts. And that children from ethnic minority backgrounds did as well or better than white pupils in compulsory education. The bars here show you how boys at school are doing with their grades versus the average. So you can see that the worst performing are black Caribbean and white British, while the best performing are Indian and Bangladeshi boys. But fails to answer the question, this assess assessment begs the question of. Problem, some of this data relies on small sample sizes. Some of it reflects company structures as much as their attitude to ethnicity. And experts warn that far from providing definitive answers, some of the data only raises further questions. What are their outcomes? Young um, BME people are treated less well, they earn less, and their chances of progression are considerably smaller. Apparently, their outcomes are down to, a, are many, are down to many individual uh, factors, including class, geography and cultural background. Blaming disparities on economics, geography and culture. To look at religion, family structures, uh, health issues, wealth, background and all of these things that all have a part to play, all the socio-economic factors have a part to play in our lives. Of course, race is not the only story. Nobody claims it is. Now, this wouldn't be a euphemism for it's your own fault, get over it. Would it? Even if we rounded up and deport, uh, took every black person out of prison and deported them all, we'd still have the highest prison population in the whole of Western Europe. As it seems, this report is intent on slavishly following 
the government's line that there is no racism here. Our survey said. <laughs> Arguably, it's achieving exactly what the government wanted. Out and out racism. And if we use that catch all phrase, we're kind of undermining the issues that are there, such as geography, class, wealth, health, religion, culture. Adding credence to the false binary that underpins their cultural war agenda. I think it's interesting. I got 32 jobs and most f***ers say they can't find one. <laughs> that the nation faces a choice between addressing racial inequalities or class disadvantage. If you have a rose-tinted view of the effect of British interference in other nation-states affairs in the past, you'll be more susceptible to believe that there will be a benevolent outcome in interference in the present and in the future. This is what's called the black or white fallacy. This brings us on to another curious finding of this report. The acronym BAME, that's Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic, should no longer be used. Is unhelpful because it bundles different ethnic groups whose experience of racism varies. Eradicating the systemic racism and the institutionalised racism that we witnessed on repeat in like, schools and health cares and prisons. Hardly original though, as it's been disliked by many ethnic groups for, for a while now. Anyway, but having dismissed BAME, they on 87 other occasions deployed the term ethnic minority, which seems like a distinction without a difference. And is clearly what the methodology is here. Undermine any unity or possible unity amongst desperate groups. Instead, it has chosen to divide us once more and keep us debating the existence of racism rather than doing anything about it. By placing black British Afro-Caribbean boys lack of attainment in schools central when compared to their African counterparts. Can't be the case if black African kids are excelling throughout primary school, excelling throughout secondary school, twice as likely as white kids to go to university. While completely ignoring how the intersection of class that is that it claims so intent on in, uh, including in its reasoning. We found that though those race disparities weren't, weren't, were caused by many factors. Are also to blame for why the black indigenous population are much like their white working class and low paid counterparts. There is a cultivated ignorance about the way racism actually works because it's very, very painful for many people. Being indoctrinated to devalue uh, education and um, in disengagement in politics. What the white indigenous population who this report is really meant for should really take away or read between the lines of here is that this government and most of the ruling classes really prefer cheap immigrant labour over its feckless indigenous population. Anyway, even with, the, even with these supposedly improved circumstances, for black and brown folk in educational obtainment. How about when people leave schools and enter the workplace? This chart shows you pay gaps with white British workers. So you've got white Irish, Indian, Chinese tend on average to earn less. Why do black and brown people, but particularly the black community, still face severely disproportionate outcomes? And for black and minority ethnic people, the unemployment rate is around about 9%, compared to 5% for white people, with black people at 12% and Bangladeshis at 11% amongst those most severely affected. Even when compared to their working class or lower paid counterparts. Though there has been many improvements which this report attempts to over -egg and exaggerate. To say that Britain is a model to the world is to say that our police officers don't shoot as many black people as they do in the United States. It more or less attempts to sweep those inequalities under the rug or just engage in what about it. We recognise that racism is the factor. You know, what we're saying is that it isn't, I mean, notions of institutional racism isn't, isn't really the key element. In one of the examples about ethnic migrant ethnic minorities earning more than their white counterparts before the age of 30, which is totally disingenuous, as is also used to dismiss any equalities women face in the workplace. 
If Pam wants to show more cleavage, she should be able to. I encourage that. But the truth is that predominantly the top 5% or the top 20% of earners are white male who have generational wealth which they can pass on to their children after they're 30. But let's not focus our attention on that one, hey. Not just content with pitting other ethnicities against one another. Watch research into the success we're seeing in the country. So why don't we look at the success of the Chinese communities and the Indian communities and why they're performing so well and try and mirror that across the board so that we can re replicate the success factors so that all children do well. It completely misses the mark or conveniently sidestepping an explanation into why there's a huge disparity with black Caribbean boys, predominantly black British. This report could have drawn attention to the disproportional exclusion rates of black Caribbean boys at our school. And how certain uh, generational stereotypes lead to these poor outcomes. The scapegoat groups within our school. Not convenient enough um, evidence, I'm guessing. Or even with the supposed improvement in some ethnic minorities' exam results. These four young people, three of them graduates, have, between them, made more than 60 job applications in the past few months, all without success. This fails to translate, though, into any significant increases in their ability to go to top universities or the pay ceiling to go beyond that they obtained, had obtained by the time they were FA. Look at me, I'm a grad student. I'm 30 years old and I made $600 last year. Bummer, don't make fun of grad students. They just made a terrible life choice. Just as it disingenuous is the report's false characterization, characterization of demands by students and lecturers at many of the universities for the decolonization of the curriculum. There is nothing more revealing of the fact that the British state and even the people that pretend to cheerlead for empire knew it wasn't a good thing than Operation Legacy. The report mischaracterizes these demands as the banning of white authors. I want to speak about a dangerous trend in race relations that has come far too close to home to my life. This crude attack line, like so many other things in this report, is inflicted with a patronizing tone like uh, of intergenerational ignorance. The well-intentioned idealism, it says, of those young people who claim the country is still institutionally racist. A dismissal of the politics and passions of ethnic minorities and the desires for inclusion in history. What we also need is the police to also admit when they're wrong. Where the authors dismiss this as the well-meaning ideally idealism of many young people who claim the country is still institutionally racist is not borne out by the evidence. When what's really happening is in our university is the curricula is being expanded to include the voices and the stories of those formerly colonised people. Now, on to criminal justice. We're definitely not a beacon for the world. If we look at our incarceration figures, they're worse than America per capita. Um, if we look at deaths in custody, if we look at stop and search and, and drug stops and searches, they are, are um, disproportionate to the crimes that are being committed and they are focused on black men especially. Though this report is pretty slim on the detail on that one. It does claim though, with its, so, with its catch-all phrase, We no longer see a Britain where the system is deliberately rigged against ethnic minorities. The impediments and disparities do exist, they are varied, and ironically, very few of them are directly to do with racism. A variety of individual factors that it's more down to single mothers and income. Political authorities in this country are considered to be useless, surplus to requirements and a threat. And so if you bang them up, or over them, they actually become in a way a great generation of nice middle class jobs. That it is to do with any inter 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 institutional system that is deliberately designed to stereotype and perceive black and brown people as more of a threat. Gene based racism, black people are genetically violent so it actually doesn't make a difference whether they're well educated or not, whether they're a Premier League footballer or a, or a corner street drug dealer, it doesn't make any difference whether they're David Ajay or Oswald Boateng. Well I guess deliberately overlooking that black and black British uh, males were still four times more likely 
to be stopped and searched. By far and away, black people who get stopped and searched the most more than any other ethnic group. Or the overrepresentation of certain ethnicities and the convictions for crimes that their white counterparts just get a slap on the wrist for. Police arrived on the scene, and the expectation was that they'd surely take the man who appears intoxicated into custody, or at least have him take a breathalyzer. Instead, police let him stagger off, and he can barely walk. Also, no attention paid to the potential prevalence of secretly right-wing, dark web um, groups within the Metropolitan Police Force. As also last week, a Met officer was convicted for his links to a neo-Nazi organization. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Nor did they sit down with Mina Smallman, who last summer lost her two daughters. Tell that to Mina Smallman, who was mourning her two black daughters. You know, in the Deep South, when they used to lynch people, and you would see smiling faces around a hanging dead body, those police officers dehumanised our children. After they were stabbed brutally to death in a park, um, and then later two police officers were arrested for taking photos with the dead sisters' bodies and posting them in a WhatsApp group. Much of what, much of what this report has set out to do is really to undermine much of what? And actually, a complete insult to people that have been victims of institutional racism um, um, going going back years. Has already been done since the McPherson report. The publication of today's report on the killing of Stephen Lawrence must lead to new attitudes, a new era in race relations, and a new, more tolerant and more inclusive Britain. Where the phrase institutional rac racism became part of the lexicon. Now Dr. Saul is making the case that this is lazy and now an overused term. But if we acknowledge that there is racism here in the UK, we have to acknowledge that actually some of that racism will creep into institutions because how firmly can we say that, you know, when we leave our houses in the morning that you're, you're able to kind of put your unconscious biases on the kitchen table, grab your keys and head into the office and as you swipe in, you're a fair member of the team. Unlike, however, the overuse, the overuse of his, a variety of individual factors. Now, in 1999, the McPherson report stated, So institutional racism, which is first coined by Carmichael and Hamilton, is, says it's a system which isn't just about the school or about the, or about the banks or about the one part. It's about a society which produces, consistently reproduces racial and equal outcomes. Now, this report seems not to use this data or assumes based on its own preconceived ideas that it's not important. Uh, well, it doesn't just ignore the lived experience. It actually ignores all the data and the research that's been carried out over the years. I mean, the government itself just had two reports in 2017. Because now that there's been, been some levels of increment of improvement, we are a beacon to the rest of the world on anti-racism. <laughs> which is the general overview of this report, though it does not uh, though it does acknowledge some racism. The report concludes race and racism have become less important factors. So they've done it in a really clever way because they've got some black and brown people to speak on their behalf. It reduces these truth claim and evidential experiences down to anecdote and individual cases. As much as lived experiences are important and everyone's personal individual anecdotal experience is important. Anecdotal experience. Not down to, li not down to deliberate institutional racism. Now, that is true to a certain extent. Our frame of reference for racism in this country is outdated and flawed, therefore rendering the report inaccurate. Because we have moved from being an overtly racist society to a covertly racist society. Which again, this report has done nothing to unpick. Our litmus test for whether you are a racist. Also, it's assessment that there is a lot of racist, uh, racist abuse online, pointing to the fact that when people can sit behind their keyboards in shroud and, and the safety, that these racist tropes are more openly exercised. But I suppose lots of individuals don't make up a community 
or institutions though, do they? Ultimately, we have to see this report as just another attempt to divide and derail us. And we have to resist it every step of the way. And on that note, I'm going to leave it here. But I want to follow up this video in the coming days that outlines what I believe is the most worrying thing in this report. But until then, I'll leave you with this. Beware of listening to these imposters. You are undone if you are to forget that the fruits of the earth belong to us all and the earth itself to nobody. You keep doing it and you take my kindness for weakness. Mm -hmm. And that's what they've done. They've taken kindness for weakness. Mm -hmm. They'll just turn the other cheek. They'll just go to church and pray and Lord, everything gonna be okay. Nah, hell nah, they go to church too. Mm -hmm. So what's their God telling them? Break it down. Break it down.